Today's supersizer is 10-year-old Cameron Stannard from Brighton. Weighing in at just over 11 stone, he's four stone heavier than he should be and needs help now before he gets any bigger. I think of my body as quite useless, so I want to lose some weight. Cameron is a snackaholic who grazes on sugary treats all day. My favourite foods are sweets, chocolate, biscuits and crisps, pizzas and fish and chips and ice cream. When he gets home from school, he normally has biscuits or a packet of crisps. And then he'll keep pestering me till dinner time. And then throughout the evening, he'll keep saying, can I have some biscuits? However, when it comes to how much snacking her son actually does, Mum seems to be a bit in denial. I wouldn't say that Cameron overeats. He eats all the wrong stuff, but it seems that the food doesn't like Cameron. <laughs> With both Eloise and Cameron's dad working full time. Nice, Cameron. Bye. Bye. Eloise never cooks from scratch and relies instead on fat laden, calorie packed, frozen ready meals, but with one vital ingredient missing. I try him with different vegetables and he'd be picking at it. And he'd go, No, I don't like that. I'm not eating that. I hate vegetables because they're just horrible. They don't have a lot of taste, that's why I don't like. But with only a few months before Cameron starts senior school, Eloise is increasingly worried that his size will attract unwanted attention. Now he's going up to secondary school, I'm worried that he's going to be meeting new people and there's going to be people there that might not be so nice as the people at his junior school. She says in senior school there's more bullies to pick on people. And um, I wish I can like lose a bit of weight because it makes me slow and and I don't like my man boobs. Help me lose some weight. So I am going to be helping mum and son to get his diet back on track in the feeding clinic. Cameron, tell me why you want to lose weight. Well, I want to lose weight so I can do like most things that my friends can do, like. They could run probably a bit faster. If and you think losing some weight will help with that? Good, I think so too. It's going to require a lot of dedication on your part, though. I can't wave a magic wand. It's you that has to do the work, and it's you that has to do the cooking and buy the food and make the decisions, and it's you that has to eat this food. I am going to give it a good go because I want to try and eat more healthy food, mm. but I probably wouldn't eat it all if I tried and didn't like it. OK, I mean, you don't have to like everything. But what you do definitely have to do is my rule number one is you have to give everything a try before you decide you don't like it. But Cameron's not the only kid who turns his nose up at food. Meet super skinny Alid John, accompanied by mum, Jane. 15-year-old Alid weighs a minuscule seven stone, four pounds, at least two whole stone less than he should. Well, I'd like to have a bit more muscle, be, be, um, have more strength, because I'm quite weak. Which isn't surprising, given how little Alid eats. I'd say I'm not a healthy eater because I don't eat lots of fruit and veg or anything like that. I just eat rubbish. Because most of the time, I'm not that hungry. Well, he's been a fussy eater since he was a baby. No vegetables, then no fruit. So got to the point where he wasn't eating at all. His mum, Jane, battled with anorexia when she was a teenager. And when his weight plummeted to five and a half stone last year, alarm bells rang. We sort of realised, well, hang on, this is getting out of control now. Because of my past experience with anorexia, I, I, it really frightened me, the fact that he wasn't eating. I was, we did think, oh, gosh, is he anorexic? But Mum's fears were allayed when Alid was diagnosed with Crohn's, an inflammatory disease of the intestines. It explained why he'd been avoiding food, because it could trigger an attack, causing stomach cramps, diarrhoea and tiredness. He was put on steroids then, which was a miracle drug. But despite not having an attack in the last eight months, Alid's still scared to eat and refuses most foods. So the things I don't like are fruit, vegetables, scrambled egg, salads, rice pudding, because it looks like sick. I think the texture puts it off the most, and then the taste and appearance. But Alid's starvation diet leaves him with no energy, and he spends his days hiding away in his room. 
it's like really tired and out of energy. So I don't go out a lot because I can't be bothered. So I just, like, just can't do anything, just stay in bed. But Mum Jane is seriously concerned about the future. Not right for you to outlive your child, which is what I'm going to do. <laughs> he's going to, I'm sure he's going to have some awful illness or something before me. So Alan and Jane will join Cameron and Eloise in the feeding clinic to put a stop to their deadly eating habits before it's too late. Help me understand, why have you not been able to do anything about it so far? I don't know, really. It's just... Won't try. I don't like trying new things. I mean, I tell you, my initial analysis, if you are, is that Crohn's has definitely affected you. But at that point, you learnt to ignore hunger. And your body now is in such a state of starvation that it's used to it. it that's normal for you. And what we have to do is feed you up a little bit to make you realise what being hungry is like. And that really, I think, is key for you this week. Yeah? Would you agree? Yeah. I asked the kids to keep a food diary for one week. And with everybody now in the clinic, it's time to confront them with their terrible tucker, starting with Alid. Let's have a look what you eat for breakfast. Here we go. And is that it? Yes. Let's go on to lunches. What's this? Ham sandwiches? Mm. Golly, quite a lot of ham sandwiches. Variety-wise, well, we ain't got a lot in this tube. No dessert? Not an apple, maybe, afterwards? Banana? No? Right, so let's go on to dinners. So we've got some spaghetti, the unidentified chicken parts in breadcrumbs. <laughs> Lovely. Have we got any more dinners to come? Oh, come on, that can't be it. <laughs> you must snack. Mmm. <laughs> Hasn't made a lot of difference, really, that, has it? <gasps> it's shocking. All the things that you're feeling can actually be really easily explained by what's in here, or rather what's not in here, and what should be in there. Right, do you think yours is going to be any better than that? No. No? no? <laughs> You're getting a bit worried now? Yeah. Whoa, OK, so there's quite a lot of bread. All right, let's move on to have a look at your lunches. Wow, a piece of fruit! Two pieces of fruit! Three! All right, let's see what else. Oh, dear. Now it all goes wrong. Let's move on and have a look at your dinners, yeah? Wow, OK. God, this all looks yucky, doesn't it? Where's the fruit and veg, Mum, in dinner? In the cupboards, cos you won't eat it. All right, let's have a look at your snacks. Oh, no. So lots of crisps and ice cream. Is this starting to explain now a little bit about where we've been going wrong and the sorts of changes we're going to need to make, yeah? Cameron should be eating around 2,200 calories per day, but on some days, he's eating 2,500, which across a week is like eating a whole day's worth of extra food. Alid, on the other hand, is only eating around 1,250 calories a day, less than half the 2,700 he actually needs. That means that he's missing out on almost four whole days worth of food every single week makes me feel like I'm a bad mother for giving him the foods that are in there. It's quite shocked me. I was shocked because I didn't think I would eat that much in just a week. So I need to just cut it down a bit. Looking at it, it makes me want to change how I eat and what I eat. That's terrible, actually. I knew it was bad, but not that bad. It's the second day in the feeding clinic, and dietitian Ursula is doing what Cameron and Alid's mums should have done years ago, taking control of the boys' diets. This morning, the families are sitting down together for a cooked breakfast, a nutritious grilled alternative to a fat-laden fry-up. I've got used to not having breakfast, so then I thought of that looks really daunting. There are foods on the plate the fussy boys would usually refuse to eat, but amazingly, it's the mums who turn their noses up today. Bacon, going in. <laughs> I can't stand mushrooms. But Eloise and Jane should be leading by example. You go with a bit of mushroom or tomato, and I'll go with the bacon. 
This breakfast is better than I thought. I think both mums did really well. They both forced themselves to eat it, and I think that that really helped them to encourage the children to have a go at things. I can't believe you're eating that mushroom. However, the boys draw the line at the vitamin-packed tomato. Just have a, have a little bit more. No. Tomato is horrible. Try the tomatoes and they're horrible. The texture, the just juice squirting out. The taste oh, is revolting. But to help everybody see why improving their diets is so crucial, I've lined up some gruesome pictures to show them the effect a bad diet can have on the body. What do we think? Not Gross. nice. And what is it, do we think? A tongue. tongue. It's a tongue. And this doesn't look normal, does it? This is a condition. It has all sorts of different causes, but one of them is not eating enough iron. And do you know what that's called? Anemia. Mm. It's anemia, exactly. Is your diets are so bad, both of you, that you're both deficient in iron. Iron deficiency can also cause tiredness, pale skin, constipation and depression. To ensure your kids get enough, feed them red meat, fortified breakfast cereals and beans. OK, so what on earth is that? Any, what part of the body is that? The back. Absolutely right, it is. There's a lot of curvature, isn't it? Why do you think that's happened? Lack of calcium in the bones. <gasps> oh, you're good. Your mum's showing off now. That is a condition called osteoporosis. And I'll tell you something really awful. What's happening is the bones that support your spine here are just crunching into dust and collapsing. You're both low on calcium in your diet, OK? And you, Ali, you're only getting half of what you need in your calcium. Quite shocking. <laughs> yeah. Where's calcium found in our diets? Dairy. Uh, absolutely, it's found in dairy. What else? Fish. Yeah, fish. And also things like nuts and seeds are full of calcium. It's not ever just one thing that you have to eat lots of. There's always plenty of variety of things you can eat to get these sorts of vitamins and minerals. One of the images of this um, crooked spine, which was quite weird. And there's another one of the tongue that was all inflamed and stuff. So that one was quite weird because low iron, and that's what I've got. Got to be like more responsible for my food. I have to eat quite a lot more than I usually do. So finally, Alid's realising what he needs to do to sort out his weight. But I want the mums to face up to where the boys' issues with food came from in the first place, and their family photos may help. Now, this one was when we were on holiday. He just was a bit fussy with his vegetables at that age. It didn't look like it affected him at all. No. Now, this one is my worst one. I just, oh, I just look at that and that is horrible. That is awful. Why do you think it's so horrible? Because he's like um, five and a half stone. Oh, don't get upset. From about here, um, he wouldn't let anybody take any photos of him. Yeah. That's a sneaked, a sneaked one. But you can see how dreadful, how dreadful he looked. And he bruised dead easy, so he was covered in bruises. So I thought people will look at him and think I'm not, you know, I'm a bad mother, I'm, I'm hitting him or something, or not feeding him. People are always saying to me, why don't you just make him eat it? Just put it in front of him and make him eat it. But they don't understand, he, he will not eat. And they say, oh, well, he'll get hungry and eat it eventually. But he wouldn't. Jane's recognised that Alid has got a problem with food and will give both mum and son as much guidance as we can to sort out his problems for good. But whilst Alid's not eating anywhere near enough for a boy of his age, an increasing number of young people are actually starving themselves almost to death as their inability to eat enough descends into the deadly condition anorexia. Today, we hear from Emily, whose pursuit for perfection turned into the illness that nearly killed her. Hi, I'm Emily. I'm 16. I love fashion and I love spending time with my friends. <laughs> I'm studying 4AS levels and I would like to be a doctor. But I'm also a recovered anorexic. When I was 10, we moved to Yorkshire as a family and in moving schools, I was moved up a year. Just felt completely and utterly lost, lonely, isolated. And I really wanted to grow up, and with that came the idea of eating less. And one thing led to another, really. 
started off just maybe not finishing my plate at a meal, but then as it got worse, just kind of felt good eating less. From then on, it just became an obsession. I describe myself as a perfectionist. I just put my perfectionism into wanting to be perfect, to having an eating disorder, to wanting to be the thinnest. I knew the amount of calories that was in practically everything. I'd memorised the back of packets. Calories were just, they are what ruled my life. It just got worse. The more weight I lost, the fatter I felt. So I would eat less. I just always hated my own body and thought I was fat and disgusting. It was very difficult dealing with my parents. We would just fight all the time. Your relationship becomes very fraught. You can't communicate. And what happens is that the illness just consumed her, just consumed her totally. And, and she becomes very difficult to reason with. They didn't know how to deal with it, and I didn't really know how to deal with it. I knew there was a problem, but I didn't understand what the problem was. And I never, ever thought that it was anorexia. One morning, my mum just took me to A&E, and they said that I was go starting to go into heart failure and gave me a few days to live if I didn't start eating, which I wasn't going to do, so I was tube fed. You're there spoon feeding her and she's swearing at you and cussing, just hurting you, hurting the people that are closest to her. No matter what anybody said, I couldn't see past, I want to be thin, I want to be the best, I want to be perfect. At that point, I was too focused on wanting to lose more weight. Our relationship became rock bottom. I loved her dearly, but we had no relationship and that was very difficult. I remember the turning point to when I wanted to make a change. I managed to get through it because I knew that if I kept going, then things would get better. So I kept eating what I had to eat and I went to therapy. My relationship with my parents at that point was quite bizarre. We were just really trying to learn to trust each other again. She started to deal with her anxieties. We started to formulate a relationship. And then she started gaining strength from supporting others while she was in the unit. Now, I just want to help other people. The main thing is my blog, which is a place where I express my thoughts about having an eating disorder, being recovered from an eating disorder. As a former victim of anorexia, I can confidently say that an eating disorder is not glamorous, fashionable or cool. It takes everyone and everything, leaving you with only hatred and fear. My blog is also a place where people can ask me any questions about recovery and a place where they can get support from me, basically. After embarking on what seemed to be a never-ending journey, I broke out of my cell, annihilating anorexia once and for all. And the winner is Emily Jane Crammell. Recently, I've won an award for Inspirational Recovery. I was nominated by some people that I've supported. Even if just a few people fall across my blog, then that's a few people who might not get so caught up in it and might actually decide that they want to change. Since she's recovered, she's fully embraced life. We've been through a very trying time. I think we're stronger as a family and I'm so proud of her. If your child is showing signs of uh, illness or, or, or behaviours that aren't quite right, then please don't discount the fact that they may have an eating disorder. If you can intervene early enough, then there's a strong possibility that it may not take a grip like it took a grip on Emily. I think the biggest lesson is no matter how deep you think you are into it, there actually is a way out because I'm evidence that you can beat this and you can get better. Don't give up hope because no matter how dark it might seem, there will always be light at the end of the tunnel. To find out more about childhood anorexia and where to go for help, log on to channel4.com slash supersizekids.
Back at the feeding clinic, I want Cameron and Alid and their mums to face up to just how much and how little they've been eating. So the kids are sitting down to a straightforward meal swap. But I've not yet dealt with Cameron's excessive snacking. To show him and his mum how all that extra food is contributing to his obesity, we'll serve his early evening snacks with his main meal. It means Cameron has to watch Alid work his way through a snackathon of pizza, two cans of pop, and two ice creams. I didn't have two ice creams. You did on. It was one. Yeah, and then you had another one later. No, it wasn't. I never have two ice creams though. No, but on this day you did. No, I didn't. You... I only had one. Yes, you didn't eat it all in one go, but you ate it in quite a short period of time. That's why we've given it to Alid. Okay. Okay. So annoying. What's annoying you then? I didn't actually have that that day. But it was written in your food diary though that you had this much. Do you think you're going to manage that? No, I don't think so. Just eating a whole pizza is quite difficult. Alid makes a valiant attempt to eat everything, but struggles. And for Eloise, the penny drops. Cameron's snacks and meals add up to way too much unhealthy food. At the moment, I'm feeling dreadful. Feeling really ashamed. Yeah, it's really hit home what I'm actually giving him or letting him eat. I obviously know I'm doing something wrong. And hopefully, this will teach me. It's the start of day three in the feeding clinic, and Ursula has prepared breakfast for the boys and their mums. This morning, it's crumpets and a nutritious muesli mix of oats, fruits and nuts. Oh, I don't like porridge. What is it you don't like about it? The taste. Ugh. You said you would try everything. You haven't, you're not even trying it. I have tried it. One little mouthful. You need to keep going. I don't like nuts, though. Cameron, you're starting to make me angry now because like you promised nuts. that you would try them, but you are not even trying. I am trying. No, you're making me angry now. Tastes you've had... so sick. No, it doesn't. It does. Don't say that because other people are eating. It does, though. I'm kind of sick and it's horrible. Mum wanted me to eat it, but I tried the fruit, but she still made me try to eat it and I not eating it ever again. I'm worried that when we get home that um, this is going to happen. He's going to fight against the things that he doesn't like. And I think being at home, I'm, I won't give in to him, but I can see us arguing a bit more. But standing up to Cameron and not taking any nonsense at the table is exactly what Eloise should have done years ago. Mums and dads have got to start putting their foot down when it comes to their children's diets. But I'm not letting the nation's kids off the hook either, who also need to start taking responsibility for what they put in their mouths. We know from studies that the terrible eating habits you develop as a child become harder to break as you get older. I do care more about what, like, what I look like on the outside than I do on the inside. But most of the time you are more worried about what your hair looks like and things like that than you are actually what you're doing to your inside. So all week, I've been on a mission to show the kids of Britain that a bad diet can make you seriously ill and even bring on premature death. Using our actual slices of human body, I'm going to show these kids that if they don't change their eating habits now, it may be too late in the future. One slice is underweight. It's, like, disgusting. And, like, green on his arms and... Oh. One is normal weight. I don't like to think that that's inside me. <laughs> like, it's a bit cringy. And the other is overweight. This slice is a photographic representation. It's all pink. It's just not what I expected to see inside a human being's body. It's not what I imagined. What I want to talk to you about is the genitourinary system. Do you know what that means? No. What does genito mean? Genito is genitals. And what's the urinary? We. We. So, so let's do the urinary bit first. What was the main organ responsible for making your wee? Bladder. Bladder. Doesn't make it. What does it do? Oh, it helps 
Uh, uh, it's 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 yeah, it stores it. What makes your pee? Your kidneys. Because your kidneys they clean do. Your blood. Absolutely right. What happens, right, when you've been really busy at school and you haven't had a drink of water all day and you have a pee? What does it look like? Yellow. yellow. Yeah. Well, more than yellow, isn't it? <laughs> it's like yeah. orange day glow yellow, isn't it? <laughs> and why is that? Dehydrating your yeah. blood control to keep your water. Yeah, because your kidneys are conserving as much water as possible because you're dehydrated and it's only letting the muck out. Right, what happens when you've drunk masses and masses and masses? What colours are you wearing? Yeah. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Clear, because you, you've got too much water on board and you've got to pee it out, haven't you? So they're really clever things, your kidneys. So if we come over here, being his size, what sort of problems do you think he might have with his urinary system? By the way, first of all, where is his urinary system? Can you see kidneys? Yeah. 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 Where are they? The red bits. Who wants to come up and show me? Someone come and point. Somewhere like there. That's exactly it. Where's the other one? Where's the third one? They don't have a third one. <laughs> they don't have a third one, you're right. Can you see how they're absolutely surrounded by fat, tons of abdominal fat, and that fat is going to have some sort of effect on all those organs? People who are really, really obese often have high blood pressure. Has anyone in your family got high blood pressure? My dad did. Probably. Your dad did have high blood pressure. Yeah. I can guarantee if you get to this size, you will get high blood pressure. And one of the things having high blood pressure does if you don't treat it properly is it damages your kidneys. And then what do you think happens? Kidney failure. Kidney failure yeah, happens. Someone can donate a kidney, can't they? Yeah, you only need one. If you're very lucky. But if you've got multiple kidney failure, and you can't find kidney donor to donate one to you because there's not... You're in trouble. Then you're really in trouble, aren't you? What's going to happen? Die. Die. It's not good, is it? What about the genital system? What do you think the sort of problems he has with his sex drive? Being that sort of size can actually make the whole act quite difficult. If you've got this much fat all around this area here, what do you think <coughs> happens to your testicles? They burst. They cook. And what do you think your sperm production's like? Not very low. So, what do you think his chances are of fathering a child? Love. Sex life isn't the only thing to worry about when it comes to overeating. Obesity is also linked to an increased risk of developing bowel cancer, with obese men and morbidly obese women 50% more likely to develop the disease than people with a healthy weight. So, what about our skinny man over here? by not eating, all the delicate things like the sodium and the potassium in your blood get really, really imbalanced, and it can really upset your kidneys. And a lot of severely ill anorexics who absolutely do not eat often end up with multiple organ failure, including kidney failure, and that's usually the cause of death. What about the genital system? What about in women? Do you know what happens to them in their cycles, their periods? It's they don't have them. And if you're not having periods, what does that mean? You can't have babies, so you are infertile simply by being underweight. It's really uh, made my eyes open to see like what type of food you eat, and like maybe I should like stop eating all like the cheeseburgers and that. It's like, quite scary to know that somebody did actually end up that weight, and it does matter to take care of your body and have a balanced diet. Back in the feeding clinic, whilst Eloise is starting to stand firm, I'm not sure the message is quite sinking in with Cameron yet. So I've arranged a very special postcard from America to convince them to make the change now before it's too late. My name is Travis Swafford. I am 13 years old and I weigh 18 stone. Sometimes when I'm hanging out with my friends or if we're playing football, I tire out more easily and I'm not as fast as everybody else. When I'm playing sports or at swimming pool sometimes, I wear this spandex polyester fabric shirt, t-shirt kind of thing that's called Under Armour. So it makes me look better and uh, it makes me feel more confident. Myself as well as his mother kept telling ourselves that Travis would lose this baby fat and he would be fine, where we should have watched much more closely. I feel I'm very responsible personally for his some of his weight issues because I did not take control of this a while back. When Travis was 11, he was 13 and a half stone. He was allowed to eat as much as he wanted to eat, and that's a big mistake. My biggest fear is that Travis is gonna have troubles maybe being diabetic, as well as heart problems from carrying so much excessive weight. If I could go back in time, 
I would definitely have changed Travis's eating habits long ago. I was about nine years old when I felt self-conscious about my weight. Kids at school would always make fun of me and call me names and call me fat, and it made me feel bad. Once in a while, I was at the bus stop, and a kid would come up to me and slap me in the face and run away, and I couldn't catch him, and it made me feel bad. Hi, Eloise. I want to just let you know that don't turn a blind eye on your son, Cameron. Work with him now before things get out of control. If you work at it now with him and change his eating habits now, it'll be much better for him in the future so that he ends up with not having the weight issues like Travis has. Cameron, when you get older, it could be bad. And uh, if, you, if you start losing weight now, it'll help you later on. And uh, never give up. So Cameron, what did you think of that? Um, well, I quite felt, quite felt sorry for him because he was like, he kept getting bullied at school and um, it was quite upsetting that he didn't and my mum was worrying about that. She was, wasn't she? You actually said you didn't want him to be bullied, yeah. It was, everything was Cameron. Obviously he's a bit older, but yeah, the way his body, um, his issues, what he was saying that affected him. Yeah, I could just see Cameron in him. Well, I suppose the important point is this is further down the line, and as he so correctly said, start now, yeah? Obviously, Travis was a bit older, but I think his family wished that they'd started when he was a lot younger, and it hit me that I thought, my son's going to turn into this boy. It made me feel a bit like I had to, like, make a change now, and it was a bit sad, but... If I listen to him because he knows what I'm going through, he can, like, help me a bit. With Cameron finally realising it's going to take a lot of hard work to change the habits of a lifetime, I want both these fussy boys to sit down to a blind taste test. The point of the blind taste challenge is to encourage the boys to explore new foods and tastes they'd usually refuse to try. I'm dreading this. First up, Smoked salmon. Fish. Like worms. Mm, nice. You think it's nice? Very smoky. I quite like it. So it was salmon. Was it something you've had before? No. Tried normal salmon before, but not smoked salmon. Looking at it, do you think you would have tried it? No. Because it doesn't look nice, does it? But actually, it tastes quite good. Next up, a fruit. Do you like it or not? Yeah, it's all right. It's nice. I quite liked it, and it is, in fact, kiwi. Do you think you'd have that again? Oh, i would have it again. Yeah. That is a result, and with confidence, the boys attempt everything, including kidney beans. Not nice. What does it taste like? Soil. A pickled onion. Do you like it? Oh. Yeah. And olives. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They might only have liked some, but at least they've tried. And it will be a major breakthrough if they can eat the final food, a green vegetable. Quite crunchy. Yeah. I'll let you put in a face. <laughs> Quite crunchy and it's got a weird aftertaste on it. I like it. You like it? Mm -hmm. It was a sugar snap pea. Mm. Tastes better than just a normal pea. So you think you might be able to eat that in something? I would have it again. Oh. Result. Before they go home, I want the mums to learn that cooking healthy meals from scratch doesn't have to take all night or break the bank. They've been left a recipe to make a pork stir-fry. Following the recipes, good so far, cos I wouldn't know what I was doing, wouldn't know where to start. Back home, Eloise never cooks from scratch, but after her time in the feeding clinic, she's determined to change that. At the end of it, I think we're going to be proud that we've actually made something from scratch, cos I've never done it in my life because there's always been some kind of frozen thing in there or some kind of sauce. But do you have any of this stuff in your cupboards at home? Not at the moment, but we will have when we get home. As from tomorrow, it will be the parents' responsibility to ensure their sons eat a balanced diet. Do you think 
I don't think you're a pro, Mum. What's that thing that pork's in? Um, soy sauce. I don't like soy sauce. There's lots of things you don't like, so... So you're not eating the nuts either, do you? I don't like that. So what do you like about the meal? Pork. The pork? Do you like the pork? So if I made a few little changes at home, would you eat that? If I took the peppers out? And the nuts. And the nuts and added some other vegetables that you liked. Yeah. I think when it comes to dinners now, I can I know they, they're going to be a struggle because the last couple of meals there's been things that Cameron hasn't liked about him and, and moaned about, but I'm just going to have to put my foot down and I'm going to have to be strong. And as from tomorrow, I'm going to have to be that hard mum now. Dinner over, the boys enjoy their time together. And Alid's mum is left amazed at the effect eating good food and much more of it is having on her son. I just can't believe the difference in such a short space of time. He's normally in bed at home, fast asleep, and he's out playing with Cameron on the trampoline. He's just a different boy. All the new foods have been trying. It's given me a lot more energy eating all this new food and the amount that I've been eating as well. I'm quite determined to carry on eating the way I am now so I can stay and get more healthier, have more energy. It, it's just been absolutely fantastic. I've got my son back. The feed clinic has um, helped us to bond. <laughs> I'm not crying because I've stabbed, it's brilliant. With their stay in the feeding clinic at an end, everybody wakes up focused on the task of returning home armed with their 12-week healthy eating plans. I think I'm going to get on really well with my diet because if I can do it here, I can do it at home. Yeah, I'm feeling quite confident about carrying on with the diet plan when I get home so I can put on more weight. They'll be back in three months to find out how they've done, but from this moment, they're on their own. Good luck, all the best. Good luck. Good luck. And ring yeah, any time. Can Alid continue to eat more and try new foods? And will Cameron take the diet seriously and try harder to lose weight? Back home and armed with their 12-week diet plans, Cameron and Alid try to survive with no junk food. And Alid seems to be in control. My mum's made me take more responsibility, so I've been in charge of cooking it and preparing and, like, dishing it out and everything. He's actually said a couple of times, oh, I'm hungry, which I don't think he ever has said that. I think I'm liking food a bit more now. With my portion size, they've gotten a lot bigger, and I've been having food a lot more often now. As a result, Alid has more energy, is more sociable, and spends more time with his family. At Cameron's house, Eloise has swapped the oversized frozen ready meals for home cooking, but Cameron is still hard to please. I don't think I've been trying as much vegetables because I don't like them and I don't think I've been, like, giving it my best shot. Halfway through the 12 weeks, things aren't going quite to plan. On the down days, it's when Cameron won't try what I've cooked. He wants snacks all the time. Of course, then I'm fighting with him, saying no, no, no. I know she's upset and um, she really wants me to... Um, lose a stone. I've got to try really hard because I know my mum's been trying really hard. But the big question is, with six weeks left, will Cameron try harder to lose the weight? And will Alid keep up the good work? Three months ago, super-sized Cameron and super-skinny Alid checked into the feeding clinic. And now they're back to see if they've turned things around. I'm feeling nervous about today because I can see how much I've put on after the 12 weeks. I've tried really hard on this and I don't want to be disappointed today. Before I reveal the results, I want a private catch-up with the mums, starting with a much healthier-looking Eloise. Tell me how things have been then in the last 12 weeks. They've been hard, I won't lie, they have been hard, but um, I'm proud of what we've both achieved. What have you learned now? What's different? Um, I've learned how to cook. I, I can't believe how easy it is to actually cook a dinner um, and how much more satisfying it is giving it to him. I've learned how to be strong and I've learned how to say no. If he hasn't eaten a dinner, that's it, he goes without. So you are now in control? Yes. And you think you weren't before? No. Cameron, welcome back. Nice to see you again. Hello. 
You look very well. Thank you. Tell me how the 12 weeks have been. There's been some ups and down times where sometimes I wouldn't eat or sometimes I would eat. Are you still being a bit fussy then about certain things? A bit, but I think I'm getting used to eating the right things. And then a really important question now is, do you feel different because of all this hard work? I can feel like I'm getting more breath now when I'm running and I can feel like um, I feel more awake and um, if I stick to it, it'll change more. But have things gone equally as well for Alid and his mum? So, Jane, tell me about Alid and how the 12 weeks has gone. Well, Alid has been really good and is trying all sorts of things. Mm. And uh, we're having quite good fun cooking together. And he's realised it's a life plan. Alid, hi. Welcome back. Uh -huh. How are you? Good. It's good to see you. So, 12 weeks later, what's new? I feel a lot more energetic and like, happy and just good generally. And, and how's your mum sort of helped you in all of this? Yeah, she's helped by cooking foods and like encouraging me when I'm feeling a bit down. And, yeah, she's not nagging me as much. Coming to you guys as was my last, you know, desperation measure. And I can't believe how, how much progress we've done in just the few months that we haven't been able to do in five years, you know. So you're feeling a lot happier oh. and a lot more comfortable about his health oh, and his future. I'm so future. happy, I just can't yeah. put it into words. But before the families find out if it's all been worth it, it's time for everybody to be reunited. Wow, look at you. Thank How are you doing? Oh. I'm good, thanks. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. Well, I've got to have an eye, really. Yeah. Yeah. Keep up with him. Right, gang, I'm going to come and interrupt you. Weight-wise, then, the moment of truth. Alid, I'm going to do you first. You've put on almost a stone, 13 pounds. Uh -huh. You're actually oh, one pound off the stone. So well done, Alex. Unbelievable. Given that you've got Crohn's, you've overcome that magnificent. Well done. I'm so proud of you. Right, Cameron, what about you, then? You've lost more than a stone. Oh, well done. You've lost 16 oh, pounds. One stone, two pounds. Unbelievable. And that's why you're feeling the way that you do. Mum? Really well done as well. I'm proud of him, he's done the work as well. Fantastic. Are you happy? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Was it easy? Probably not. Were there battles? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Was it worth it? Oh, yeah. yes. Absolutely worth it. I don't think I would have put on that much in this time. Yeah, I'm really, really chuffed with the result. I thought, oh, maybe we'd get half a stone, but gee, double, double that is, is oh. God, it's amazing. I'm really happy with myself because all that hard work paid off. I'm chuffed, I really am. Um, I knew, I knew he'd, um, he'd lost a little bit, but not that much, so yeah, I'm really chuffed. Yeah, I feel I can carry on with it because the weight's given me a boost, so I know I can put on a lot more. Well, I'm, I'm really, really happy. <laughs> <laughs> If you want to find out how to give your kids the best chance of living long and healthy lives, then have a look at our website for nutritional information, tips and support on how to become a more confident parent. Next week, it's the return of the adults. Nine supersizers and nine super skinnies enter Dr. Christian's feeding clinic for the most dramatic swaps yet, including, for the first time, a double swap. This is so much. I don't think I can go another couple of hours without any food. Mm. Mm. Felt like just picking the fork up for him and shoving it down his throat. And our supersizers are in for a supersized shock as we send them stateside to meet some of the biggest people on the planet. I don't want to die. Plus, we explore eating disorders, from anorexia to the secret world of bulimia. I just think it's made me realise how bad <laughs> I really am. And I think I'm being complete tonight.